All right, so I've almost entirely moved to the new spot, and I've got the kettlebell over here, and I, I do a workout, and I'm going to keep doing these and shaming myself and making sure I get some sort of workout. I already ran today. I already did the, the thing, ran through the neighborhood, uh, getting a lay out of the land, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and this time I'm going to make it slightly more rewarding intellectually intellectually rewarding I'm gonna have some stuff going on here so it's not purely a meathead uh, meat show and uh, as you can see the cacti I have a nice sunny spot that uh, they're gonna be a lot happier on the porch uh, so here we go about 20 minutes or so of me just breathing hard <laughs> All right, can everyone hear me? All right, welcome everybody. Please welcome, uh, please join me in welcoming President Bogus to the stage. I don't want to see you. Thank you. I'm glad to see all of you here today. Um, I want to first thank uh, um, Professor Ebert for arranging this event and extending an invitation to Noam Chomsky. When I asked him, how did you get someone of this stature here? He said, I just called. And I think, wow, just reaching out like that can make a, a world of difference. And I'm glad each of you can be here and to hear from someone who is so distinguished. The Concord University community is truly honored and grateful to have Noam Chomsky with us today. If I had unlimited time, I would still not be able to give a proper introduction to someone as accomplished as he. After all, I'm introducing one of the top ten most quoted sources in the humanities, a list that includes William Shakespeare and the Bible. With this in mind, and because we're all here today to listen to him, I'm going to be brief. Professor Chomsky is a renowned public intellectual whose ideas and scholarship are known the world over. He's been described as one of the most widely quoted, most widely cited, and one of the most influential intellectuals of our time. Anyone involved in a serious exploration of the social problems of this world must engage with his ideas in one way or another. In 1955, Professor Chomsky began teaching at MIT, where he is today an Emeritus Institute Professor in the Department of Linguistics and Philosophy. His pioneering work in linguistics changed the course of research in the cognitive sciences before he even reached the age of 30. <clears throat> Professor of Ling Ling Linguistics Neil Smith of London's University College remarked that Professor Chomsky did for cognitive science what Galileo did for physical science. Professor Chomsky is tireless. He's an author of over 100 books and a highly sought after speaker at the most prestigious institutions in the world. I could go on for quite a long time describing the wonderful career and critical contributions of Professor Chomsky, but we're all here today to listen to his words. I can't think of a better person to speak to us on the topic of poverty and inequality in a nation of plenty. Please join me in welcoming Noam Chomsky to Concord University. Hi. Hello, if we could once again welcome uh, Noam Chomsky. Uh, and you, excuse me. Let me adjust the technology a little bit. Uh, can you hear and see me? Very well. Very well? Okay, then I'll continue. Maybe your, uh, your head's a little bit cut off, if you bring the camera down a little bit. We can't see him. How's that? Uh, lower. The other direction. There you go. Very good. <laughs> okay, and maybe you could turn up your volume a little bit more because ours is maxed out. I think okay. we can hear you just just fine. We can't quite hear you. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. Not as well. Okay. 
not giving you any information. This is going well. Can you hear me now? Uh, it's, it's the same. Okay. It's okay, we'll try to make out. We'll do our best. We'll tell people to shout their questions at the end. So. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, the questions that were raised about poverty and inequality were uh, directed specifically to ourselves, to the United States, which, of course, uh, makes perfect sense. But it's worth bearing in mind that the issues that we're discussing are not confined to our own country. The, the U.S. is a very significant and in some ways a quite shocking example. The same neoliberal policies of the past generation that are leading to sharply increasing inequality in the United States, along with uh, undermining of democracy and uh, breakdown of social cohesion, uh, have been applied in much of the world over the past generation. Uh, there has, uh, and there have been similar effects in weaker societies, uh, often uh, devastating effects. There has also been significant poverty reduction during this period, but rather strikingly in the countries that have not accepted the neoliberal principles that the U.S. and its allies have been advocating. So the greatest progress in poverty reduction was in China, uh, where the uh, whole system of policies is totally different. And that's rather general. As far as inequality is concerned, it's been growing quite rapidly worldwide. Uh, every year, uh, Oxfam, leading development agency, publishes a detailed, extensive report of the state of poverty and inequality in the world. In the year 2014, uh, they found that about 90 individuals uh, literally had half of total world wealth, which is an extraordinary degree of inequality. Uh, uh, in the year 2015, their latest publication, which just appeared, it's, the number has been reduced from 90 to 62. 62 individuals hold half the world's wealth. And there are many very ugly consequences to this. Uh, to take one example from the Oxfam report, uh, they point out that 5 million children are dying of starvation every year. That means about 500 or so while we're meeting, 500 children starving while we're talking. And they could very easily be saved. The resources are certainly there to save them. But policy is designed so that it goes to enriching the super rich and the powerful, not to saving millions of children from starvation. Uh, the, the, there is an organization of the rich developed countries, the OECD, uh, in the 31 countries. Uh, among the OECD countries, the U.S. is at the extreme in both inequality and poverty. Just quote from the latest OED uh, report on this. It says, uh, the share of top incomes in the past year increased especially in English-speaking countries in the United States far more than others. And by a top incomes, they mean the top 1%, by now a fraction of 1%. That's where there's been an explosion of uh, uh, inequality, huge explosion, uh, primarily in the United States, also to some extent in other English-speaking countries. Uh, and. Uh, uh, poverty uh, remains at extraordinary levels. Uh, with regard to poverty and inequality, uh, by most measures uh, in the OECD studies, the United States ranks with the poorest of the 31 countries. It ranks alongside of Mexico and Turkey. Uh, poverty rates and inequality in the United States are much greater than poor or quite poor European countries like Portugal. And this has been consistent over 50 years. Uh, the same is true of measures of social, social justice. And 
that's measures that include things like uh, infant mortality, uh, uh, hunger, and so on. Of the 31 OECD countries, the United States so, ranks 27th, right down to the bottom, right along with Greece, only slightly above Mexico, Chile, and Turkey. Uh, that uh, there is uh, an associated and quite striking fact, which you perhaps have read about in the newspapers. It's recently been discovered that among a sector of the American population, the less educated uh, whites, mainly white males, that means with only high school education, uh, among this large sector of the American population, uh, life expectancy is actually declining. Now, that's something that is unheard of in rich societies. The life expectancy continually rises. The United States is not particularly high in life expectancy, uh, but for the, that life expectancy should reduce among a major sector of the population, less educated white males, that's unheard of. Uh, these are surely consequence, all of this is surely a consequence of uh, the neoliberal policies of the past generation, uh, deregulation, marketization, uh, decline of public institutions and so on. It has led to a general in the United States, and similar things are even worse elsewhere. It's led to a stag pretty much stagnation for much, in fact, the majority of the population uh, sometimes decline. Uh, real wages, actual wages, uh, uh, evaluated relative to inflation, real wages for male workers are now at the level of about the late 1960s. There's been considerable growth, but it's gone into very few pockets. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, almost all the growth has gone into a tiny percentage of the wealth, the wealthy population. Uh, the, uh, so the, there is, in fact, now this radical concentration of wealth, and not in parts of the population that are really productive. Much of it is in the financial institutions, which have a dubious and maybe even harmful effect on the economy. And this is uh, understood by the major uh, uh, powerful institutions. So, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, Citigroup, one of the major financial institutions, uh, published a report for, its, for, the, for the investors, the investors in that Citigroup deals with. And it urged them to uh, direct their investments uh, to what they call the Plutonomy Index. Plutonomy means the sector of the population, the wealthier sector of the population. They said worldwide, incidentally. So the economy is a worldwide class system of very wealthy people. Uh, the, uh, and it says the, uh, the mostly in the United States, but also some elsewhere, some in China, some in Saudi Arabia, and so on, but primarily in the United States, that uh, that's where the real good investment opportunities are. You can kind of disregard it the rest, they're not important. And in fact, it's now common to, to, to divide the world's population into a plutonomy, which is the uh, upper sector of wealth and power, uh, and the what's sometimes called the precariat, the people who live precarious lives uh, without security, without benefits uh, uh, in many countries, uh, including rich countries in Europe. Uh, there's the unemployment among youth is extraordinarily high. Uh, people are living at home into their 40s, can't, can't start families, get no jobs. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's the precariat, part-time jobs, no, no just uh, Same in the United States, uh, take colleges and universities, which increasingly are hiring temporary workers, uh, adjuncts, uh, graduate students, people of no protection can be dismissed easily or paid very little, and that's the precariat. Uh, so the world is kind of dividing into a plutonomy and a precariat, and as many have pointed out by now, the super-rich really inhabit a, a different world, a world that barely has contact with the general population, except to, to extract resources from them. Well, there's much debate about the causes for all of this, turns out to be many complexities, but there's 
ample evidence that it doesn't have to do with any economic laws, but to largely with uh, policy decisions, and not economic necessity. And uh, if you look at the policy decisions keeping to the United States now, uh, we should recognize that the United States is uh, different from other societies in many ways. Uh, one way is that it's by far the richest society in the world with incomparable advantages. That's been true since its founding, in fact, uh, throughout its history. Uh, the United States has, has been uh, the richest or close to the richest country in the world by the late 19th century. Uh, the U.S. economy was greater than that of the other advanced societies combined. Uh, 20th century uh, uh, just accelerated this. I'll come back to it. Uh, so, uh, but although the United, that's one respect in which the, and of course the United States has enormous advantages, huge territory, relatively un, underpopulated once the indigenous population was eliminated or destroyed, uh, enormous internal resources, uh, extraordinary security, and so on. But also, to an unusual extent, the United States is a business-run society. It's partly the result of the fact that it didn't grow out of existing feudal institutions. It uh, became, to a high extent, run by the business world. And that's revealed in many ways. So take, say, uh, voting, much on everybody's mind right now. Uh, the United States has a pretty high abstention level, people who don't vote. And that's been investigated with interesting results. Uh, one of the leading scholars who uh, studies uh, uh, contemporary electoral politics, Walter Dean Burnham, a very distinguished scholar, about some years ago did a study, a careful study of the socioeconomic profile of non-voters in the United States. And what he discovered is that uh, their socioeconomic profile matches those in Europe, similar societies, those in Europe who vote for labor-based or social democratic parties. That sector of the population in the United States just doesn't vote because uh, nothing represents them. There are no such parties. Uh, just recently, uh, uh, Dean Burnham, same scholar, and uh, Thomas Ferguson, a very prominent political scientist, uh, did a careful, very careful study of voting in the most recent election, 2014. Did a careful county-by-county -county study of uh, just what voting was like. And they came out with a pretty spectacular conclusion. It turned out that voting in that election was approximately the same as in the 1820s when the vote was restricted to property white males. 2014, about the same level of voting, which tells you quite a lot about participation in what's called a democratic society. And these results are amplified when we look at how people are represented by their own representatives. There's a way of studying that. It's a major topic in uh, academic political science. Uh, you study the policies that the representatives vote for, that's public, and you study the attitudes of the people who, who they represent, their preferences. We know a great deal about that from extensive and quite reliable and consistent polls. And it turns out that for about 70% of the population, the lower 70% on the income wealth scale, they're basically disenfranchised. Of their own representatives vote in ways dissociated, unrelated to their preferences. Now, as you move up the income wealth scale, you get a little more influence on representatives. And at the very top, which means really a fraction of 1%, policies are essentially made. Uh, that's, that's very good work on that by Mark Gillens, Larry Bartell, other mainstream political scientists. Now, there's a recent study by Gillens and uh, Benjamin Page, a well-known political scientist, published at Princeton University, in which they investigated a couple hundred major decisions that were made and they compared by the political system, and they compared the 
decisions with popular attitudes. And here's their conclusion. I'll quote it. Uh, economic elites, I mean, a tiny fraction of economic power, uh, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. government policy, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. The results provide substantial support for theories of economic elite domination and for theories of biased pluralism, but not for theories of majoritarian electoral democracy or majoritarian pluralism to decode to the political science rhetoric. Uh, what it means is, in simple words, the United States is a plutocracy with some formal democratic elements that are increasingly at the margins. And the public is aware of that. Uh, they may not read, people don't have to read the political science journals to see it in their lives. We see it in much of what's happening now. And in fact, it uh, turns out that policy in general uh, often is quite contrary to popular preferences. Uh, studies of, extensive studies of people's attitudes. And even if you study sectors of the population of the type who say, you know, get the government off my back, I don't want to have a government, uh, even those sectors, turns out that attitudes are pretty much social democratic. Uh, of, the, of the, the kind that's missing in American politics. So even among those sectors and in the population generally, there's strong preference for more spending, for uh, uh, education, uh, uh, for health, uh, for uh, uh, not for welfare. Welfare has been demonized uh, primarily by Ronald Reagan uh, with these uh, fanciful stories about, uh, you know, uh, black women driving in their limousines uh, to steal your money at the welfare office. Of course, nobody wants that. But the things that welfare does, yeah, Jesus. namely aid to women oh, with dependent okay. children, so on, there's very strong support. Uh, one of the interesting cases is national health care. Uh, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, is considered an extremist uh, because he's calling for national health care. If you look at polls, uh, for a long time, as far back as polls have been taken, the national health care has been very popular. Uh, right now, at this moment, uh, about 60% of the population think we should have national health care. It's a pretty remarkable figure when you recognize that almost no one speaks for it in public, and whenever it's mentioned, it's uh, uh, demonized. Nevertheless, 60% uh, of the population think we ought to have it go back a few years to the Reagan years, about 70% of the population thought that there ought to be a constitutional guarantee of national health, of health care, national health care. And indeed, about 40% of the population thought there already was a constitutional guarantee, meaning they regarded it as such an obvious uh, uh, desiderato that it must be in the Constitution. Uh, when President Obama came along with his uh, Affordable Care Act. Uh, there was originally a mention of having a public option, meaning people could choose if they wanted to have public health care. And that was supported by about almost two-thirds of the population, but it was simply dropped without discussion. And as I say, it continues today. Well, coming back to Sanders, uh, his advocacy of national health care is considered an extremist position, same of, uh, with his other positions, so say free college tuition and so on. Now, these are policies that would have been, that wouldn't have surprised President Eisenhower in the 1950s. His policies are basically traditional New Deal policies of the kind that even the moderate Republicans like Eisenhower recognized in the 1950s and are supported by a large part, often a great majority of the population, and have been for many years. But they're considered extremist for a simple reason. The mainstream political spectrum has shifted so far to the right 
that positions that were mainstream in the 1950s uh, now seem to be extremists. Uh, taxes are a very interesting case. There have been polls about taxes for decades, regular polls. Uh, basically two questions. People are asked, uh, are your taxes too high? And people say, yeah, I'd like to pay less taxes. Uh, are taxes on the rich too low? Sure, the rich ought to pay much higher taxes. That's consistent. And it's very interesting. There have been a few studies to, which show that when these polls are reported, it's typically the first question that's reported. Taxes are too high. Not the second question, which says taxes are too low on the wealthy. And you go back to the 1950s, the Eisenhower period, taxes on the wealthy were far higher. The top rate was 90%, in fact. It's been cut back regularly over the years in direct opposition to the popular will. Uh, so by now, in fact, uh, uh, the poor probably pay a larger percentage of their income than the rich in taxes when you consider the whole array of uh, largely regressive uh, uh, taxes, state, local, uh, social security, and so on. Uh, that's, uh, uh, these are all the effects of policy decisions in recent years which have uh, led to the uh, extreme inequality and the maintenance of very high levels of poverty. Uh, there used to be, uh, in the 1950s, there was a kind of a quip that the United States is a one-party state, uh, the business party, which has two factions, uh, Democrats and Republicans. If you come to today, it must be a little different. It's still a one-party state, business party, as these results as mentioned indicate. Uh, but it doesn't have two factions anymore. There's only one faction, and that faction is not Democrats. It's moderate Republicans who call themselves Democrats. As the spectrum has shifted to the right, today's Democratic Party is even the left wing of it, like Sanders is uh, running on the Democratic ticket, is, uh, is very much like uh, what the Democrats would have been, even moderate Republicans would have been in the 1950s. Uh, meanwhile, the Republican Party has simply drifted off the space. Uh, highly respected uh, political commentators, conservative political commentators, like uh, Norman Weinstein of the Conservative American Enterprise Institute, and simply described today's Republican Party as uh, what they call a radical insurgency, which has abandoned parliamentary politics. And uh, to be frank and honest, it is literally a threat to human survival, if only because of its the attitude, almost uniform attitudes of the, the political leadership, those who are running for president, uh, on the issue of global warming. If they mean what they say, it's almost a death knell for the species. That's not a small point. Well, all of this becomes even more clear if we look over the history. As I mentioned, throughout most, perhaps all of its history, the United States has been the richest country in the world, in comparable advantages, the late 19th century richer than other major economies combined. Uh, the 20th century was punctuated by devastating wars, World War I, particularly World War II. Uh, they destroyed or devastated U.S. competitors, which were already far behind economically, and they enriched the United States. So during the Second World War, uh, wartime spending ended the Depression, it quadrupled industrial production. Uh, the United States economically benefited enormously, while its other industrial societies were that seriously harmed or even destroyed. At the end of the war, the United States literally had half of total world wealth, which is incomparable. Now, that couldn't remain, of course, and over the years it's somewhat declined as other industrial societies reconstructed and uh, the underdeveloped societies, so-called, began to develop the Brazil and others. Uh, by 1970, the world was described, uh, the U.S. share of total world income had to reduce to about 25 percent, which is still enormous, but it's not 50 percent, uh, roughly the same now. But the United States still does have higher per capita income than rich European societies, but the main reason for that is that Americans put in about 20 percent more work hours a week over the year than is done in comparable societies. And it's far from obvious that that's a healthy or desirable policy choice. Uh, another historical pattern of crucial importance is that over time, progress towards social justice correlates with popular activism, and primarily over time in the labor movement. Now, the U.S., as a business-run society, happens to have an extremely violent labor history, uh, where hundreds of workers were being killed in industrial actions in the United States well into the 1930s, uh, when this nothing like that was happening at all in comparable societies. Uh, back in the late 19th century, the labor movement was extremely powerful. Uh, in the main industrial centers, like, say, western Pennsylvania, there were towns that were simply run by labor. Uh, Homestead is one example. And meanwhile, it was still mostly an agricultural country, and a radical farmer's movement developed, beginning in Texas, then spreading through Kansas and other areas. The populist movement, which had 
extremely radical programs. They wanted to free themselves from the control of northeastern bankers, northeastern merchants, develop their own uh, financial, merchant, cooperative, uh, uh, distributive, other systems. The most, ra- the most, top- the most radical popular movement in American history uh, was beginning to link up with the work- growing workers' movement, which was openly calling for workers to own and manage their own factories. Uh, this was mainstream American radical populism, with very few European inputs. It was pretty much crushed by force, uh, literally by force. Uh, the final blow was uh, Woodrow Wilson's uh, Red Scare, most severe period of repression in American history. By the uh, by, the 1920s, uh, the labor movement had been virtually destroyed, picked up again in the 1930s, popular uprising, CIO organizing, labor militancy, sympathetic administration, and that led to the New Deal measures, uh, which significantly increased uh, social welfare and justice as part of a radical democratic uh, uprising throughout much of the world. Not a lot to say about this. Uh, time is running short, so I won't go into the details. Uh, but there has been a reaction, a strong reaction, uh, ever since uh, the end of the Second World War, uh, picking up in the 1970s with the neoliberal program. Uh, and the net effect of it is uh, what we see today, uh, policies of deregulation, which have led to regular crises, concentration of wealth in financial institutions, uh, 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 Bill Clinton's program of destroying the welfare system, uh, ending welfare as we know it, had a really seriously harmful effect on the people who need welfare, especially women with uh, dependent children. Uh, right now there are three million children in the United States who are living on less than two dollars a day. Uh, lots of unskilled labor, which helps uh, because there's a work requirement, which drives down wages, there's much else. Uh, there's a kind of a vicious cycle. Uh, the increased concentration of wealth leads to concentration of political power, leads to policy choices that increase the country. Now, actually, as I mentioned, the population is certainly aware of this, uh, but reactions often take destructive forms. In Europe, the centrist parties are declining. Uh, there's a rise of uh, uh, popular movements on both extremes, the nationalist, uh, sometimes proto-fascist right, uh, the social democratic uh, left. And here, too, we see the same thing. The Trump-Sanders phenomenon illustrate that. Uh, could turn into something like the rise of radical democracy in the 1890s, 1930s, and 40s with very positive results of setting off a reaction from wealth and power, or it could turn into something else. I'll just mention in closing that I'm old enough to remember the 1930s, my childhood, and there was something similar at that time, collapse of the center, rise of uh, popular movements on the right and the left, and it didn't turn out very nicely. I'm old enough to remember listening to Hitler's speeches in Germany, uh, and I couldn't understand the words. There was no mistaking the fervor of the response and the passion of the uh, uh, delivery and the reaction to it, and you know what came out of that. I don't want to draw analogies too closely, but there are things to be deeply concerned about in the current situation. I'll stop with that. We'll now open the floor.